Hello and welcome. This is going to be our first quarter final review lecture video. Let's go ahead and get started with question number one here. What is the unit for volume units in chemistry? What I was looking for here is liter. We then attach prefixes to this like milli, a milliliter, but the base unit there is liter. What's the abbreviation for gram? A little g. Abbreviation for milliliter? ML, formula for density. Density is equal to mass divided by volume. And typically for mass, we're always gonna use grams and volume could be milliliters or cubic centimeters. They're the same. More commonly we use milliliters. So grams per milliliter gives away the formula mass divided by volume. What is the unit for mass used in chemistry? Well, grams is the, the main one. Um, kilograms is actually the, the more standard uh, default, uh, especially once you get into physics, you use kilograms as your default, but anything with grams would be acceptable. What is the unit for volume in chemistry? That's milliliters or uh, cubic centimeters. Um, again, these are equivalent. Uh, you could also do other cubic units like a cubic meter, but we wouldn't really normally be doing chemistry with something as big as a cubic meter. That's, that's like the size of a, um, a big bathtub, would be a cubic meter of water. All right, let's do some conversions. Let's practice how we actually set these up. So start with what you know. Whatever the first number is, it goes in the top left uh, spot of our unit conversion brackets. Then we draw a line, and now we have to get the units to change to be this. So I don't know how to go centimeters straight to millimeters, or maybe you do, but I'm going to use the fact that I know there's a hundred centimeters in one meter, and there's 1,000 millimeters in one meter to convert this. See, the uh, centimeters will cancel out and the meters will cancel out, and I'll be left with the unit of meters, uh, of millimeters. Now we just multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom and divide and see what we get. So this is gonna be uh, 76 millimeters. Next one, kilometers to centimeters. So again, start with what you know, put the 12 kilometers up top. All right, if you don't wanna draw a line all the way across, you can just keep multiplying by fractions. So can I convert kilometers directly to centimeters? No, but I do know that there is, in one kilometer, there is 1,000 meters. So I'm taking it back to my base unit. Notice I put kilometers on the bottom. And then I know that in one meter, there are 100 centimeters. And now I put meters in the bottom, so meters will cancel and kilometers will cancel. And I multiply across the top and I'm going to get uh, one, two, zero, 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 or 1,200,000 centimeters. On to our next one, 85.5 liters times the fact that in one liter, there's 1,000 milliliters gives us 85,500 millimeters, milliliters. Uh, kilograms to grams. So in 13.4 uh, kilograms, I know that one kilogram is a thousand grams. Kilo means a thousand. Kilograms cancel out and now I've got uh, 13,400 grams. And now on to some time conversions. We should know our conversion ratios like the back of our hand for these ones. It's just putting them in the right order. So two hours times the fact that in one hour is 60 minutes times the fact that in one minute there are 60 seconds should get us our final unit of seconds. So I knew I needed to get the units smaller and smaller. That's why I went hours to minutes to seconds. 
Now hours cancels, minutes cancel, and I'm left with two times 60 times 60, 7,200 seconds in two hours. Now let's go weeks to minutes. So in two weeks, you can figure out how many days by multiplying it by the fact that one week is seven days. Or you could skip this and just jump straight to the fact that it's 14 days. In one day is 24 hours. And in one hour, there's 60 minutes. So hours cancels, days cancel, weeks cancel. And I multiply across the top. Two times seven times 24 times 60. And I get 20,000. 160 minutes in two weeks. All right, on to a density problem. A block has the following dimensions, 19.2 centimeters by 2.6 centimeters by 6.2 centimeters. And we have its mass, what's the density? Volume equals length times width times head times height. So let's multiply our length times width and height. So 19.2 centimeters times 2.6 centimeters times 6.2 centimeters equals 309.5, but what's the unit? It's centimeters cubed. Centimeters times centimeters times centimeters is centimeters cubed. All right, so that's our volume. And right here we have the mass. Density is equal to mass over volume, which equals 367.24 divided by 309.5. And our units there is going to be grams per milliliter. Cubic centimeters can become milliliters. They are equivalent. So 367.24 divided by 309.5 is 1.187, and we'll round it there, grams per milliliter. All right, now find the density of an object. This one just gives us the mass and the volume, so 7.9 grams divided by 18 milliliters equals 0 0.439 grams per milliliter. Technically, we'd want to round to two significant figures, 0 0.44. I'm not going to be a stickler on that on the test. Uh, an interesting, interesting thing to note about these two is that this first one is more dense than water, so it would sink in water. This next sample is less than dense than water, so it would float on water. Water has a density of one gram per milliliter. So you can tell this one's a little bit more dense, this one's a little bit less dense. All right, moving on. On to unit two, atomic theory. So given 16 with this big N, identify the number of each subatomic particle. So that N is the chemical symbol for nitrogen, we find, have to find nitrogen in our periodic table and see that it has seven protons. So let's put a seven right there. Now we don't see a charge, so it must be neutral. So it's got seven electrons to balance its seven protons. How many neutrons? Here we need to look at the mass number 16 and we can just do the 16 mass number minus our seven protons equals nine neutrons. All right, write the isotopic notation for the most common isotope of this atom. So 16 is not the most common isotope. If we look at the atomic mass and round it, we'll see that 14 is the most common. So this should be 14 nitrogen, or how we actually say that is nitrogen 14. All right, uh, isotopic notation for the following, a neutral atom with 31 protons. So we get on our periodic table, we find atomic number 31. Its chemical symbol is Ga for gallium and 38 neutrons. So 31 plus 38 gives us a mass number of 69. So gallium 69 and it's neutral, so no charge here. 
Next up, anion. That means a negative charge of one that has nine protons. So nine protons is fluorine, F, and 10 neutrons. So fluorine, 19. We add together those, get the mass number. It's an anion. Anion, so it's going to take out a negative charge. But once it's an ion, it's one again, going to want to get a noble gas configuration. So fluorine will specifically gain one electron to now look like neon. So it gets a perfect octet. Therefore, it gets a charge of negative one. All right, cation with a charge of three. Oh, this one says charge of one. So I guess we knew that that was going to be a negative one, but that should make sense uh, with what the typical charge of an ion is. All right, so cation with a charge of three has 25 protons. So I find atomic number 25. That's manganese, MN. Uh, 25 protons, 30 neutrons together, that makes 55. So mass of 55 and charge of positive three. So you can put the plus before or after. I guess more typical is after. So moving on, uh, write the name of this, each subatomic particle that matches the following statement. Determines the identity of an atom. That should be proton. Proton determines the identity. The charge is a combination of the protons and the electrons, since those are both charged. You have to do protons minus electrons to get the charge. All right, is found in the nucleus. Well, that's protons and neutrons. Determines the mass number is protons and neutrons again. Determines the atomic number is just protons. All right, so what are isotopes? How are isotopes of a particular element alike? How are they dif different? So let's, let's keep this short. It is same number of protons, different number of neutrons, same chemical properties except mass, but the mass will be very similar between isotopes, but just slightly different because of some added neutrons. Uh, but they, you know, if this is in a biological system, they're treated the exact same and uh, isotopes can be very useful in tracking where different elements go. All right, so how do you determine the most common isotope of an element? Very simple, you're going to round the atomic mass to nearest integer. All right, an atom that has lost electrons will form, so it's losing negative charges. So think of that as minus and negative. So it'll form a positive ion called a cation. Think of a happy cat when you write the word cation. An atom that has gained electrons will form a, this is gonna be the opposite, a negative ion. It's gained negative charges called an anion. All right, and onto this table. So we have calcium 42. How many protons does calcium have? It has 20, it's atomic number 20. We can see its mass is 42, so there must be 22 neutrons to add together to get to 42. And we don't see a charge, so we'll assume it's balanced with 20 electrons. Atomic number is 20, mass number 42. Next one, nickel 54. So nickel is in that period three, group number 10. It's got 28 protons. If we start with 54 for our mass and subtract away the 28, we'll get that there's 26 remaining neutrons. Electrons will balance it at 28. Atomic number is 28 and mass number is 54. All right, can we do it with a different set? If we have 13 protons and 15 neutrons, well, the 13 protons tells us that this has to be aluminum, Al, and together that makes a mass of 28. So this is aluminum 28. Let's assume it's neutral with 13 electrons. Atomic number 13 and mass number of 28.
Now, can we do it from atomic number and mass number? So 16 is the atomic number. Let's go find that. That is sulfur, so just an S. And then the mass number goes at the end, so S31. Atomic number and protons are the same thing, so a 16 goes here. To get up to 31 mass number, we need 15 neutrons. We'll make it neutral. One more. Uh, atomic number 9 is fluorine, so F. 18 is the mass. 9, 9, and 9 across the bottom there. All right, so define family on a periodic table. This is a set of elements with similar properties. What is a period? A period is a row. They're numbered one through seven. What period are the following elements in? So potassium is in period four. Fluorine is in period two. Aluminum is in period three. And tellurium is in period five. What group slash family are the following elements in? So P uh, is going to be group 15. And it's specifically in with the nonmetals. All right, GA gallium is in group 13. Groups are the columns, by the way. And it is a transition metal. Specifically, it's a post transition metal. If you just wrote transition metal, that's fine. All right, SR strontium, number 38, is in group two. And those are our alkaline earth metals. Alkaline earth metals. And then W is tungsten, which is in group six and that's firmly within the transition metals is its family all right give me an atom with the following characteristics a halogen so you can pick anything from group 17 i'll pick iodine an alkali metal we can pick anything from group one i'll pick sodium an alkaline earth metal, you can pick anything from group two, I'll pick calcium. I'll just use its abbreviation CA, a transition metal, anything from the middle, I'll pick gold, AU. A noble gas, we can pick anything from group 18, I'll pick neon, which I'll write down because it's only four letters. All right, now we got to categorize metal, non-metal, or metalloid. So, uh, germanium is uh, number 32, and that is a metalloid. It's sort of halfway in between the metals and the metal, uh, the non-metals, right along the periodic staircase. So metalloid. Uh, cadmium, got to find cadmium. It is number 48, so that is just a metal. Nitrogen is a non-metal. Bromine, another non-metal. Sodium is a metal. We know it mostly as a salt, but in its pure form, it's definitely a metal. And then antimony, SB, is a metalloid. All right, I'll skip number 12, where you need to label the regions of the periodic table. I think that's a useful exercise, but I will be allowing a periodic table on the test that has them already labeled. Just um, refresh your memory on it, maybe one time before the test. Let's move on to the next question, um, which is about electrons. So first question here is to draw a Bohr model of a neutral nitrogen atom. 
So for the nucleus, I'm okay with us just writing the number of protons and neutrons. If it's nitrogen 14, it's got seven protons because that's what makes it nitrogen, but then seven neutrons to bring that atomic mass up to 14. If it's neutral, we're also gonna have seven electrons, but we have to get them into the right energy levels. The first energy level will have two. It always has two. The next one can fit up to eight. But remember, we only have seven total. So we're at two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's a five valence electrons because there's five in the outer orbital. All right, um, an ion of aluminum uh, 27. So aluminum has got 13 protons. And if it's up to 27, that's gonna give us 14 neutrons. Now it's time to draw those electrons. The first orbital can have two. The next can have eight. That's gonna bring us up to 10 total. And then I'm actually going to stop there. So we aluminum might have 13, but we're gonna say it lost those three so that it can become a cation with a uh, plus three charge. But this is more new, uh, stable because it's got a filled outer shell. All right, uh, next one, uh, we've got most common isotope of sodium. So sodium has got 11 protons. If I look at its atomic mass, 22.9, that would round to 23. So we need 12 neutrons. And then it says it's a cation, so it's going to lose electrons to get a noble gas configuration. Its outer shell is going to look exactly like aluminum. It only had to lose one electron to make this happen, but they still look the exact same. And I like to draw the electrons paired up. We'll talk more about that later, but electrons like to hang out in pairs, um, especially in that orbital of eight. All right. Um, oxygen 16 with a minus two charge. So oxygen, eight protons. If it's a 16, that means it's eight neutrons as well. And then it would have eight um, electrons, but it's gonna gain two and its outer shell is gonna look exactly like the other two. These um, orbitals, they, they like to be all the way filled up. So if you give an atom a chance to gain or lose electrons, it'll do that to fill that outer shell. All right, on to valence electrons. So my big trick with valence electrons is that you look at the group number. If it's in groups one or two, that just is the number of valence electrons. So group one or two valence electrons, it is one or two. All right, we're not gonna worry about valence electrons in the transition metals. We'll pick up again a group 13, 13 through 18. It's also very easy, you just chop off the one. So group 13 would have three, 14 would have four, then five, six, seven, eight. So let's just do this by group number, starting with silicon. Silicon's in group 14, so it's gonna have four valence electrons. <clears throat> Fluorine, group 17, so seven. Gallium, group 13, so three. Strontium, two. Bromine, seven. Sodium, one. Helium, two. The max is eight, so I should never see a number over eight for valence electrons. Now, when a, uh, an atom becomes charged, what charge will it take? We can do this with our table here. Everything wants to have eight. So if you're in group 18, you're good. You have a charge of zero. If you're in group 17, you wanna just gain one more electron. So it'll take on a charge of negative one. This will be negative two, this will be negative three. This will be negative four slash plus four. And then for if you have only three, two or one valence electron, you'll just lose those electrons to get a fill down or shell so plus three, plus two, plus one. Again, we can do, do it by group number. So tellurium is in 16, so it's gonna take on a minus two. Fluorine will lose one, so it'll be minus one. Gallium uh, is in group 13, so it'll take on a plus three. Strontium, a plus two. Bromine, a minus one. Sodium, a plus one. And potassium, 
of plus one. All right, draw a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum and label which side has higher energy, higher frequency, and which side has longer wavelengths. So we'll start with the far side of this. We will start with the side that is long wavelength. Being long wavelength makes it low frequency and also low energy. Long wavelength, low frequency, low energy. So at the very far end of the spectrum is radio waves. A little bit more energy is microwaves. Then infrared. All right, then the visual spectrum, all the light we can see. Followed by ultraviolet, often called UV, followed by X-ray, followed by gamma ray. And this end of the spectrum is short wavelength, high energy, high frequency. Let's go in the same order, high frequency, high energy. All right, explain how flame test works to identify an unknown substance. So we put a substance into a fire, that substance heats up. The heat excites electrons. At that point, the electrons drop back down and release light. And then the color of light is specific to different elements because those electrons can only be in very specific positions. When they move, they release light a specific uh, wavelength. And then those combinations give us the different colors, but they are specific to uh, our different substances. And so a flame test is very useful to identifying different elements. All right, that's that for this lecture video. Have a good rest of your day.